Okay, good morning, everyone. We're still in chapter 5 of Ezekiel, and we're going to be reading from 511, and we'll read down into chapter 6 and verse 7. And we're going to consider high places cast down. That's kind of the title, high places cast down. And so verse 11, he says, Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely, because thou hast defiled my sanctuary, with all thy detestable things and with all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee, neither shall mine eye spare, neither will I have any pity. A third part of thee shall die with a pestilence and with famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee and a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee and I will scatter a third part into all the winds." and I will draw out a sword after them. Thus shall mine anger be accomplished, and I will cause my fury to rest upon them, and I will be comforted, and they shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it in my zeal when I have accomplished my fury in them. Moreover, I will make thee waste and a reproach among the nations that are round about thee, in the sight of all that pass by. So it shall be a reproach and a taunt and instruction and an astonishment unto the nations that are round about thee when I shall execute judgments in thee in anger and in fury and in furious rebukes. I, the Lord, have spoken it. When I shall send upon them the evil arrows of famine, which shall be for their destruction, and which I will send to destroy you, and I will increase the famine upon you, and will break your staff of bread. So will I send upon you famine and evil beasts, and they shall bereave thee, and pestilence and blood shall pass through thee, and I will bring the sword upon thee. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Chapter 6, and verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, Set thy face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them. And say, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains and to the hills, to the rivers and to the valleys, behold, I, even I, will, will bring, bring a sword upon you, and I will destroy your high places. And your altars shall be desolate, and your images shall be broken, and I will cast down your slain men before your idols, and I will lay the dead carcasses of the children of Israel before their idols, and I will scatter your bones round about your altars. In all your dwelling places the city shall be laid waste, and the high places shall be desolate, that your altars may be laid waste and made desolate, and your idols may be broken and cease, and your images may be cut down, and your works may be abolished, and the slain shall fall in the midst of you, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So as we consider together this uh, section, just to remind ourselves that in chapter 5, we kind of uh, had the oral ministry now, after all of these acted out uh, kind of pictures that he had given, uh, the siege, uh, the famine bread, uh, all those things. Now he is giving some oral ministry as God opens his mouth and he begins to speak. And so we're kind of at the end of a section in chapter 5 where as a result of their sin and iniquity, there are certain therefores that have kicked in. We saw that in verse 7, 8, verse 10, and now we're in verse 11 where he says, Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God. And of course, we had mentioned last time that that phrase, as I live, it's like God is swearing by his very person, that his very existence. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because thou have defiled my sanctuary. And so here's a reason, really, and we've we've mentioned that this whole uh, book of Ezekiel is about the glory of God. Why God's glory could no longer dwell in the sanctuary is because they had defiled his sanctuary. And when we get to chapter 8, uh, God is going to give Ezekiel a very kind of personal look. He's going to actually literally take him and allow him to see what they had done in the very holiest of all, and how they'd even put images, all these things in there. And so uh, basically, because they had put detestable things, uh, images from foreign gods in 
alongside the glory of God in the inner sanctuary. As a result of that, he says, they've diminished the word of God. And so he says, as, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and with all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee. And in a sense, what had happened is they had diminished the word of God. They had ceased to value the word of God. And as a result of their ceasing to value the word of God and diminishing the word of God, God says, I am going to diminish you. Now, I just want to look at a couple of uh, scriptures that would show that they had diminished the word of God. Look at Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 2, just a uh, simple but powerful scripture. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And so, again, they diminish the word of God they, because the commandments the Lord God gave them, the, the very beginning commandments, we know them well. They should have no other gods before me. Uh, no idols should be made, nothing made in the image and likeness of God. And so they had diminished the word of God, and there, as a result, God was going to diminish them. Again, in Deuteronomy 12 and verse 32, it says, what things soever I commanded you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereunto, nor diminish from it. And it's a very serious thing is that we see this idea throughout the word of God that if you take away from the word of God, uh, there are very serious consequences for doing such a thing. Uh, we, we do not want to diminish the word of God. We want to elevate the word of God. We want to honor the word of God. But they, through their conduct, had diminished the word of God. And the result was God said, I will diminish them. Now, is there any kind of New Testament application to this? Well, the, the scripture that comes to mind is 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. Uh, just how serious it is uh, to defile the house of God, to not take seriously the word of God. And in 1 Corinthians 3, and uh, a couple of verses here, verse 16 and 17, he says, um, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. Speaking of the assembly, it's plural, ye. Uh, so it's the entire assembly. You are the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And so we need to be very, very careful that we do not do anything to, as it were, mar the testimony uh, of our local assembly, because there's a danger that we might in indeed find ourselves being marred by God for doing such a thing. And so, again, we need to recognize very serious implications. Notice verse 12 now of uh, Ezekiel 5. He says, A third part of thee shall die with the pestilence, and with famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee. A third part shall fall by the sword round about thee, and I will scatter a third part in all the winds. I will draw out a sword after thee. So we get uh, the consequences. Really, it's the, the amplification, verse 12 through 17, of the coming judgment. And it's really a reiteration of the interpretation of the hair that was given in uh, verses one through four. Remember, uh, he acted out uh, concerning the, the hair. And so it's kind of the same picture here, uh, just amplifying it. Three forms of judgment God would use. Uh, of course, pestilence and famine uh, would be those that were uh, in the city. Uh, they would die uh, of those causes. Of course, they go together often. Uh, malnourishment uh, of famine can also make people very vulnerable to pestilence. And so they shall be consumed in the midst of thee. So that's those that are in the city. A third part shall fall by the sword round about thee. And again, we saw that in verses one through four. And then uh, I'll scatter a third part into all the winds and draw a sword after them. And we want to notice that um, all of this, there's a reason behind all this. Notice in verse 13, it's really the God's Wrath is pointed out here as being behind this, uh, these judgments. Thus shall mine anger be accomplished. Now, I want you to notice, too, that God's anger, didn't. it's not like a, sometimes we can have a flare-up, an outburst of anger. 
But God's anger was slow building. The idea of God's wrath is that it's it's very slow building. God had been so patient to these people. He had sent prophets to them. Uh, he had spoken to them uh, for, for, for hundreds of years. And uh, slowly but surely, as they had ignored his word, his wrath built. And now it's finally reached that point where he says, Thus shall mine anger be accomplished, and I will cause my fury to rest upon them, and I will be comforted. And they shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it in my zeal when I have accomplished my fury on them. So we see, even in this one verse, mine anger, my fury, twice. And so clearly this is God's wrath has been inflamed by these people, and so much so that he's actually going to be comforted by their judgment. Now, that almost seems out of place, comforted, because, you know, again, God has no pleasure. We know that in the in the death of the wicked, but he is still, he finds comfort in their chastisement, their punishment. And the word comforted is, again, we say it seems out of place, but it's an interesting word. It's the thought of consoling oneself by taking vengeance consoling oneself by taking vengeance. And that's how it's used in the scriptures. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 24. A similar thought is conveyed. He says, Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. So that's kind of the idea. Uh, God's holy anger uh, uh, and his zeal, notice his zeal in doing it. It's kind of interesting that uh, when he talks about bringing Messiah into the world, he talks about the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. But even this judgment, it's going to be performed with divine zeal. And so again, we notice this. It says, I, the Lord, have spoken it in my zeal when I have accomplished my fury in them. And so this, this you would think, that this speech of Ezekiel, after all these object lessons, and the very fact that he's promising that God's anger, God's fury, God's zeal will accomplish these things, you would think that that would somehow put the fear of the Lord into them. But alas, <laughs> alas, they, they become so stiff-necked and so hardened to even divine reproof that it just seems that it's just like water off a duck's back. And so uh, God's anger against sin, as we know, is a holy anger. It's a righteous anger. It's not a temper tantrum. Uh, there's no doubt that these judgments would come because it was the Lord himself who had spoken. They had provoked him for a long, long time, and now he is about to act. And again, we, we have to remind ourselves that that very same holy anger that fury that he describes here was actually on Calvary in those three hours of darkness because it's a fury against sin was poured out upon him who knew no sin and yet was made to be sin for us. And so, uh, you know, usually in, in wrath, God remembers mercy. But I want to suggest to you that at Calvary in those three hours of darkness, God's wrath knew no mercy and it was poured out fully on the Lord Jesus Christ. His anger had slowly built up due to years of their rebellion, refusal to listen to his word and the words of his prophets, and now his fury would be accomplished in them by the desolation of Judah as a result of Babylon, his instrument. And now notice verse 14, Moreover, I will make thee waste and a reproach among the nations that are round about thee in the sight of all that pass by. He would make them a reproach. The whole land will be devastated because they had made him a reproach. He's a God, you know, the God of glory, the uh, the God who has done so much for them. And they have uh, out sinned, as we've said, the Canaanites, they've out sinned the surrounding nations. They have made him a reproach. Now God is going to make them a, pro a reproach. The whole land will be devastated. Just as their sin had been done in open sight of the heathen, now all that would pass by would also, all the heathen nations, would witness their desolation. God's honor had been slighted by the people and had to be vindicated. And so it would be done in a very public way in the sight of all that passed by. We'll look at that more as we can continue. But notice verse 15 for now. 
So it shall be, the word reproach again, so it shall be a reproach and a taunt and instruction and an astonishment unto the nations that are round about thee. Interesting that he's going to use the chastisement of Judah as an instruction to the nations round about thee. He's going to actually, use, they, they were meant to teach the Gentiles about the goodness of God. They were meant to be a light to the nations, but God's going to use them anyway. He's going to teach a vital lesson to the surrounding nations. And so we'll see this. And so, uh, again, his reproach is mentioned in this verse. Uh, there's a lot of repetition, really, from verse 15. His anger is mentioned as well. And so he says, so a reproach, a taunt, instruction, and an astonishment unto the nations that are round about thee when I shall execute judgments in thee in anger, and in fury and in furious rebukes, I, the Lord, have spoken it. And so, again, this uh, the, the, the repetition of fury, anger, furious rebukes uh, that we've seen already in verse 13, the nations would learn a vital lesson. What is he going to teach the nations through his dealings with Judah? What he's going to say is this, no nation can play fast and loose with God and remain unscathed. What a, what, if what a man sows, so shall he also reap. What a nation sows, so will they also reap. And so he's going to teach the nations there are serious consequences uh, to sin. I want you to go to the New Testament again with me, just in Matthew 5, just for a second. Matthew 5, verse 13. There's a, a well-known scripture, but it's, it's very uh, significant, really, because in the context of what we're thinking, my, Matthew 5, 13, he says, speaking now of the, the, the in pro prospect of the new economy that's coming in, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, and to be trodden under foot of men. Well, the nation of Israel <laughs> had been designed by God to be the salt of the earth, and they had failed miserably. And as a result of their failure, what's the result of it? It's good for nothing, but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. And this is exactly what is going to take place. It's going to be done in the sight of the nations. Just go with me again, please, to... Uh, the book of Lamentations, just back from Ezekiel. And we'll see how, uh, just as their sin had been done in public, in open sight, so was their desolation in the sight of the nations. Verse 15 of Lamentation 2, it says, All that pass by clap their hands at thee. They hiss and wag their head at the daughter of Jerusalem, saying, Is this the city that men call? the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth. And so what a reproach on the surrounding nations. It used to be the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth. When Israel were walking with God in the, the height of Solomon's reign, when, when foreign dignitaries made the trek to come and see if it was really true what they'd heard about Jerusalem and its splendor. But now, Oh, what a difference. The, the very same nations that came to see the glory of a nation that had Jehovah as its God now came and shook their heads at the desolation that they saw in the city. And so in verse 16 and 17, we'll read them both together because they're, they're really are the four instruments. We might call them four saw judgments that God is going to use to desolate the nation. So he says, when I shall send upon thee the evil arrows. So this is his evil arrows that he's sending, and he's going to define what they are. A famine, which shall be for their destruction, and which I will, which notice the I wills here, by the way, which I will send to destroy you. And he let them know this Babylon invasion, God is behind it. I will do this. I will send uh, to destroy you. I will increase the famine upon you and will break your staff of bread. So will I send upon you famine and then evil beasts, and they shall bereave thee, and pestilence and blood shall pass through thee, and I will bring the sword upon thee. I, the Lord, have spoken it. So these four 
uh, instruments, arrows um, that God is going to use, the sword, the famine, evil beasts, and pestilence. Just look at uh, Ezekiel 14 for a second, verse 21, where we have that clarified for us. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noisome beast, and the pestilence, to cut off from it man and beast. So these are God's four instruments. Now what is interesting is that these four instruments that are used for the judgment of Judah, his four saw judgments, uh, his arrows, the entire world will similarly be afflicted with these four saw judgments in the book of Revelation and the end times. It won't be just restricted to Israel, but it will include the whole world. Revelation 6 and verse 8, I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. Power was given him to them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, death, and beasts of the earth. So again, he's going to use his uh, four some judgments in the latter days on the earth dwellers, uh, those that have rejected the Lamb of God, uh, who bore the wrath uh, on our behalf. They've rejected that, and as a result, divine wrath will fall upon them. The e evil arrows of famine and evil beasts. Uh, we, we've already seen a bit of that uh, in the Old Testament, Second Kings 17. Uh, we think of the, the wild beasts and their impact after the uh, Assyrians had uh, deported uh, many uh, from the northern kingdom. It says in Second Kings 17, verse 25, And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there, they feared the Lord, therefore the Lord sent, they feared not the Lord, therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. And again, we don't want to get too carried away, but it is quite interesting to me as I follow afar the news headlines, but the number of times you read today of people, shot, uh, just somebody from our area was down in Florida, they were bitten by a shark, so wild beasts. Uh, we we hear people being attacked by different animals, and and so it's it, it, what I would say is we're we're almost it's almost like we're seeing a foreshadowing of what is to come on the earth in the coming days, and of course divine judgment is coming, and so pestilence, blood, and the sword. Uh, we know this. This is uh, something that had been predicted. Uh, that this would happen if they broke the covenant. And we look back to Deuteronomy and chapter 32, and the Lord warns of these things. Uh, and so everything that God brought upon them, uh, it, it wasn't kind of a shock. He had announced it long before. If this is how they acted in treating lightly his word, diminishing his word, uh, there would be consequences. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 23 and 24, it says, I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger, devoured with burning heat, and with bitter destruction. I will send the teeth of beasts upon them, the poison of serpents of the dust. And, and so, again, it's not that God hadn't forewarned them. And so he says at the end of verse 17 of our chapter 5, so will I send upon you famine, evil beasts, they that bereave thee, pestilence and blood shall pass through thee, and I will bring the sword upon thee. And notice this last phrase, I, the Lord, have spoken it. It is in italics. I, the Lord, have spoken. And so the idea is this. God has spoken. This is going to happen. It's the voice of God is commanding this to happen. Uh, and, of course, uh, we need to think today, uh, and sadly, people are not thinking, but uh, every earthquake, every flood, every so-called natural disaster is nothing less than the voice of God speaking to a rebellious world. And the problem is people are not listening. They're trying to come up with natural explanations for what is uh, really creation groaning because of man's sin. And really, you know, uh, we've talked about this before, uh, this 
the, the, the cult of environmentalism and that, you know, all our problems is man-made. And there's a sense that there's a truth in that, but it's not using fossil fuels that's causing the problem. It's man's sin that is causing the problem. And if we are really concerned about climate change, then there is the response, the right response is repentance for what is going on in our world and the rebellion and sin. So we come to chapter six. Now, chapter six is really important. Again, it's Ezekiel is still speaking. Uh, so God is opening the mouth that has been dumb. He's giving him a message after he has done all of his uh, action sermons. And we, we notice that uh, this particular message in chapter six is intended for a purpose. And part of the reason that this is going on is that there were, as well as true prophets, and there's always been this difficulty, you, you always have true prophets of God, but you also have false prophets. And there were false prophets among the Judean exiles in Babylonia. They were influenced by a man who was still in the city of Jerusalem, but they were certainly influenced by his teaching. And his teaching was that this will soon be over. We're going back. And so let's just look at Jeremiah, parallel passage in Jeremiah, to see this influence that is being combated here by Ezekiel. Jeremiah 29 and verse 8 and 9. For thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams, which you cause to be dreamed. For the prophecy shall, uh, they prophesy falsely unto you. In my name, I have not sent them, saith the Lord. Look at verse 15 now, same chapter. Jeremiah 29, verse 15. Because you have said, the Lord hath raised us up prophets in Babylon. Know that thus saith the Lord of the king that sitteth upon the throne of David and of all the people that dwelleth in this city and of your brethren that are not gone forth with you into captivity. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will send upon them the sword, the famine, the pestilence will make them like vile figs that cannot be eaten. They are so evil. And I will persecute them with the sword, with the famine, with the pestilence, and will deliver them to be removed to all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse and an astonishment and a hissing and a reproach among all the nations whither I have driven them because they have not hearkened to my words, saith the Lord, which I sent unto them by my servants the prophets rising up early and sending them but ye would not hear saith the lord hear ye therefore the word of the lord all ye of the captivity whom i have sent from jerusalem to babylon thus saith the lord god of hosts the god of israel of ahab the son of coliah of zedekiah the son of messiah which prophesy a lie unto you in my name behold i will deliver them into the hand of nebuchadnezzar king of babylon and he shall slay them before your eyes and of them shall be taken up a curse by all the captivity of judah which are in babylon saying the lord maketh thee like zedekiah and like ahab whom the king of babylon roasted in the fire because they have committed villainy in israel and have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives and have spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them. Even I know and am a witness, saith the Lord. And then just one other reference in chapter 28 of Jeremiah. And this is where it gets very specific, verse 3 and 4. 28, Jeremiah 3 and 4, it says, with, this, is, this is the message the false prophets are giving. Within two full years will I bring again unto this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So there's a country message. And the country message is this. We're going back. The king's going back. The temple treasures are going back, and it's going to happen fast within two years. We're all going back. So that's the message. Of course, who would, what would they rather hear? I'm sure they'd love to hear that message, right? That's, that's what they want to hear, that everything's going to be wonderful. 
on the other hand, the message of Jeremiah, the message of Ezekiel is, no, God is going to send his four sore judgments on you and you're going to perish and Jerusalem's going to be destroyed and there's no going back, not until 70 years have been fulfilled. And so very much contrary messages. So as we look at chapter six, here's the outline of the chapter. Verse one through seven, we're going to see the destruction of the shrines. So we're talking about the high places that were all over the mountains of Israel, the destruction of the shrines. God is going to oversee the complete destruction and desolation of the shrines that had caused such offense to his holy character. And so he's going to he's going to do that. And what we can say, and we will we'll say this probably numerous times in our study of Ezekiel, is that taking them back to where Abraham came out of, Ur the Chaldees, taking them to, back to the very place where Abraham saw the glory of God, left idolatry, they're going to go back and they're going to overdose on idolatry in Babylon. And when they come back, chastened by the Lord after 70 years, idolatry will never ever become a problem for the nation of Israel again. They're going to despise idolatry. And so God is once and for all cleansing the land in this instance of the high places, destruction of the shrines, which uh, we'll see um, there have been godly kings who had tried before to do it and had not, and it had happened temporarily. But as soon as that godly king was gone, they were back on the high places again. Uh, chapters 8 through 10, we're going to see a marvelous section on, on and again, it's a, it goes back to this the hair that was put in the skirt. If you remember the analogy of the strange haircut, he's going to talk about the preservation of a remnant. So we're going to see this preservation of the divine remnant, and that's going to be very significant in verse eight through ten, because even though he's going to destroy them, he he still is not going to leave himself without a witness, without a remnant, and that little remnant, from that remnant, all the promises that were once made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob are still going to be fulfilled through that remnant. The Messiah is going to come. All God's purposes are going to be fulfilled through that remnant. So the preservation of a remnant, and then verse 11 through 14, the execution of divine wrath. And so that's the kind of outline of the chapter. It's fairly simple. And so how do we know that the chapter divides up this way? Well, in this case, Ezekiel makes it really easy. So we said one through seven. So look at the end of verse seven and notice the phrase, the slain shall fall in the midst of you and you shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, we said one through seven, destruction of the shrines. What's behind it all? Why is God doing this? Because he wants them to know that he is the Lord. And verse eight through 10, preservation of the remnant. What's the point of all this? Why is he doing this? Well, notice verse 10. And they shall know that I am the Lord. Oh, there's a bit of repetition there, isn't there? They shall know that I am the Lord. Even the preserving of a remnant. What's up behind it? They should know that I am the Lord. And then verse 14, the execution of divine wrath. What's behind all this? Again, at the end of verse 14, it says, In all their habitations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, I don't know, those of you that study the word of God, don't you just love it when the text outlines itself, when, when you get this? It makes it so easy. Uh, and, and this is a case where it just it's so easy. The Lord has clearly put some uh, mile markers there for us to clearly see how he's dividing up this section. So the destruction of the shrines. And notice how it begins in verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. Now, the opening words draw attention to the fact that what the prophet says is not his own message, but comes directly from God. Now, why is this so significant? And why is it, by the way, that this phrase, the word of the Lord came unto me, is used more frequently of Jeremiah and Ezekiel than any other prophets? Well, the answer is simple. Both of these contended with the effects of false prophets who had a message, but it wasn't from the Lord. And so he, and of course, they were presenting soothing, 
but untruthful messages who confirmed the people in their evil ways rather than rebuked them and confronted them and demanding repentance from them. And so the reason he says, the word of the Lord came unto me, and he'll say it very frequently, is he is saying, this message is not mine. It's from God himself. You know, it, it's not, you know, because sometimes, you know, who would want a positive message? Uh, who would not want a message of, you know, make America great again and, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, have a go back to the glory days of the past. Surely we'd like a message like that or make Canada great again, if it ever was great. I don't know. Now, you know that kind of idea. But uh, just the th these thoughts of uh, w what we would want deep down in our hearts and without any repentance, without any brokenness, without any change, just restore the old ways through the political establishment. God says, no, that's not the way I work. And I have a message. And so he, this is the message that God speaks through Ezekiel. He says, son of man, set thy face towards the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them. Now, why is the prophet to set his face towards the mountains of Israel? And the reason is simple. These were the main centers of idol worship. This is where the infamous high places mentioned many times in the Old Testament were located. And I don't know why they chose the high places. Maybe they thought they were closer to God by building on high ground. I don't know what their thinking was, but high places was a real issue in the land uh, of Israel and Judah uh, throughout their rebellious days. And so what he's doing is he's explaining the sin, which is bringing judgment on the land. It was first and foremost a religious sin that was bringing about their desolation. One person put it this way, probably in any part of Palestine at this time, you would have found some mountain or hill crowned with an altar, one or two standing stones, a wooden pillar, and a clump of evergreen trees. And he said that would be typical throughout the land if you went through the land of, of Israel. Look at Jeremiah just for a second in chapter 3, Jeremiah 3, verses 6 through 9. He says, The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, but she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it, and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce, Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And so, again, every hill, an altar, standing stones, a wooden pillar, a clump of evergreen trees, they were flourishing centers of old Canaanite religion that should have been destroyed. Remember when they were to go into the land, what was the instructions given to them by God in concerning the, the various places of Canaanite worship? How were they supposed to deal with it? Pretty clear, Deuteronomy 7 verse 5, he says, but thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves, burn their graven images with fire. It's not that God hadn't been clear. He was so clear in his instructions. Each high place would be an altar, a sacrifice, perhaps a, this pillar, as we mentioned, um, often connected with fertility, like a, a phallic symbol, an image of the Canaanite goddess Asherah or Ashtaroth would be there. Uh, and so what God is saying is, look, the mountains had been defiled by idolatry. It was not the physical terrain that had sinned. 
but the people had polluted the holy land. Remember Zechariah 2 verse 12 calls this land the holy land in that it was a land that had belonged to Jehovah. He had given it out to them uh, on, as it were, a lease agreement. He had given it to them, but um, that land was set apart for him. That's why it's called the Holy Land. It was set apart specifically for the worship of Jehovah. It belonged to Jehovah. It was part set apart for him. They had used that very land to worship idols. Uh, just one of the reference from a minor prophet and from the, the prophecy of Micah. Micah chapter 6. And verse 2, and we read this again where the mountains of Israel are addressed. O oh, hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with this with his people. He will plead with Israel. So he's addressing the mountains, calling uh, for judgment because these places had been the centers of idolatry. But it wasn't just the mountains. Again, as we go back, uh, to Ezekiel, we'll notice in the very next verse, verse 3, And say ye, mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God, thus saith the Lord God to the mountains, and then notice this, to the hills. Then he says, to the rivers and to the valleys. Behold, I, even I, will bring a sword upon you and will destroy your high places. So, sadly, they weren't just content with high places, but also the ravines, the valleys, the rivers. And so they must have set up similar worship on those very areas as well. And again, let's just verify this from Scripture. It's always good to compare Scripture with Scripture and see Scripture does indeed verify these things. Isaiah 57, verses 5 and 6. Isaiah 57. And verse 5, he says, Inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs, clefts of the rocks. Now, let's stop there. Slaying the children in the valleys. Now, one of the chief valleys was the Valley of Hinnom. And that's where they offered their children burned to the god Moloch in the very Valley of Hinnom. So the valleys also were objects of idolatry and and terrible practices. Uh, it says, uh, again, verse um, 6, among the smooth stones of the stream is thy portion. They, they are thy lot. Even to them hast thou poured a drink offering. Thou hast offered a meal offering. Should I receive comfort in these? So so they, they made these places objects of worship. Um, of course, the water supply was always very important to any survival of any community. And so oftentimes um, they, there were uh, gods or spirits that had to be appeased by these water sources. And so they would often have shrines there to, to, to ensure, you know, keep the, keep the God happy so that we'll get good water supply. And that's how they were operating. Uh, remember when we were in Ireland, one of the things you find in Ireland is that there are all these holy wells, St. John's well, St. Kieran's well. And they, prior to the coming of Catholicism, uh, there used to be uh, places where the sacrifices were offered to uh, the, the gods, the pagan gods. And of course, what Catholicism always does is syncretization. It just kind of kind of made it after a saint, but the same practice of ensuring a good water supply came in. Superstition, all this kind of thing. It's very same idea. Jeremiah 2 and verse 23. How canst thou say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley. Know that thou hast done. Thou art swift dromedary traversing her ways. Chapter 7 of Jeremiah. Again, just showing that it's not just on the mountains, but also the valleys. 7 and verse 31. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. But even one of the kings of Israel, or of Judah, should I say, burned his son in the valley of Hinnom as an offering to God. 
Such was the sin of the nation, including child sacrifice to these demonic uh, beings. Um, so Ezekiel, the watchman, is warning the people that an invasion was coming because God had seen their sins and was about to punish them. And again, we mentioned in the last chapter the idea of the I wills, and we see them again in these verses as well. And so he says, um, again in verse 3, Behold, I, the end of verse 3, Behold, I, even I, will bring a sword upon you, and I will destroy your high places. And so, again, the I will of God. Verse 4, your altar shall be desolate, your images shall be broken, and I will cast down your slay men before your idols. Again, verse 5, and I will lay the dead carcasses of the children of Israel before their idols, and I'll scatter your bones round about your altars. So, it's a very frightening thing when God says three times, I will, I will, I will. <laughs> And when God says, I will, he's going to do it. Of that, there is no, by the way, isn't that encouraging too? When the Lord Jesus, who is indeed God manifest in flesh, says, I will build my church. <laughs> Sometimes it's a very positive thing. But in the instance here, this is speaking of divine judgment. It's not a positive thing, but it's a certain thing. That's the point. If he's going to do it, you can guarantee it will happen. And so one thing we could say is, this idolatry thing is an ever-present danger in every age. It's not just a Old Testament problem. In fact, the New Testament has a little bit to say about idolatry, and we'll just have a little bit to say. But 1 Corinthians 10, where a masterful chapter where Paul takes Israel's Old Testament experiences and then applies them directly to New Testament believers. And by the way, it just shows that the Old Testament is meant for God's people in the New Testament because Paul constantly uses the Old Testament and makes application to a primarily Gentile church, which means he must have taught them. A lot of these are from the book of Numbers. He must have taught them about the wilderness wanderings when he was there in Corinth for that 18 months. And so just notice, uh, we'll just break in verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, speaking to New Testament believers, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. Uh, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the com communion of the body of Christ? We be many a one bread, one body, we're all partakers of that one bread. Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar. What say I then? that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. So very definite. Of course, you say, well, uh, Corinth was filled with idolatry. Well, Look at Colossians for a moment now, please. In chapter 3, where we get the New Testament spin, on what could be an idol in our lives? Colossians 3, verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, evil concupiscence, and notice the last phrase, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Oh, isn't that interesting? Covetousness, which is idol. In other words, if I am looking to stuff whatever that might be, something other than God to satisfy my heart, I am an idolater. You get that? Covetousness, which is idolatry. That's this desire, this longing. It could be for a relationship with somebody, right? Covet not thy neighbor's wife. It could be for something material, um, could be for a place, a position, whatever. And if we're covetous, what we're doing is we're setting that thing as the center of my affection. That's what I want. And we have displaced God as the center of our affections. And then, of course, the, the final one, New Testament application, is in First John chapter 5, 
And I want to just read uh, verses 20 and 21 because he says, uh, verse 20, he says, we know the Son of God has come. By the way, isn't it good to know that? We know the Son of God has come and given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. Then he says this, this is the true God and eternal life. So he's just said, this is the true God and eternal life. And then verse 21, he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. In other words, be taken up with the true God, not the false gods of any particular age. Things that people look to, to find their satisfaction, to find their fulfillment, to find their needs met, to find their joy in. He says, little children, be taken up with the true God. Be taken up with the Son of God who has come, uh, who we know is true, him that is true, even the, his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. And he turned, be taken up with Christ. <laughs> Don't be taken up with idolatry in any ways. And so uh, verse 4, he says, And your altars shall be desolate, your images shall be broken. I will cast down your slain men before your idols. Isn't interesting, isn't it, how God calls them your altars? You notice that? And your altars shall be desolate. Your images. In other words, they're not from him. He didn't initiate this. He didn't ask for this. This is all coming out of them. Your altars will be desolate. Your images shall be broken. I will cast down your slain men before your idols. And so uh, God's God only, only had one altar uh, uh, or in, in Jerusalem. That, and these were their altars in contrast to the one that God had set up where sacrifices were to be offered. This oracle announces the time has come for Jehovah to clean house, to rid the land of its pagan worship once and for all. By the way, don't we look forward in eager anticipation to a coming day when all rival gods will be removed from the earth? Zechariah tells us in that day, there'll be one Lord and his name one. <laughs> oh, what a day that will be. All these, you know, think of billions of people bowing down to these false gods and idols. And in a coming day, there'll be one Lord and his name one. And of course, we know who that will be. It's going to be our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a day that will be. Oh, something we anticipate. That, that he will rid the land, not just the land of Israel, but the land, the entire land, will be rid of pagan worship once and for all. And the only worship will be to the true and living God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. What a day that is, what we can anticipate. We look forward to it. But in the meantime, there's a lot of practical lessons here. My little children, keep yourselves. From idols or oh, how easy it is to become idolaters covetousness which is idolatry may the lord encourage us with these thoughts amen